Welcome to SARC Talk. SARC is a nonprofit pan sarcoma research organization that develops and manages clinical trials in pediatric and adult sarcomas. SARC Talk is a podcast to discuss activities of SARC, interview sarcoma research leaders, and review innovative scientific initiatives in the sarcoma field. Welcome to SARC Talk, episode number one. I'm your host, Scott Acuno. I'm a medical oncologist at Mayo Clinic and Chief Medical Officer for SARC. All episodes will be posted on our website, YouTube channel, uh, SARC channel, as well as wherever podcasts are available. Today, for our inaugural SARC Talk episode, we are excited to have two sarcoma leaders, uh, Dr. William Tapp from Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's Chief of Sarcoma Medical Oncology Services, and Dr. Brian Van Tyne from Washington University in St. Louis. He is professor of the Department of Medicine, Oncology Division of Medicine and Pediatrics Department. Thank you both for willingness to be on our first SARC talk. Thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you, SARC, for doing this and having us. Yeah, I agree. This is actually an exciting new development in the sarcoma world. So I'm really excited to support SARC. We don't want to date ourselves too much, but you know this will be posted before CTOS 2022, but it'll be available for future references. So we look forward to seeing each of us uh, in person in Vancouver at CTOS. But maybe we'll start out with uh, some history of yourselves a little bit. Maybe we'll start with Bill. Uh, maybe tell us about your sarcoma journey and your present location, and tell us about your sarcoma program at Memorial. Yeah, thank, thank you, Scott. So I, I actually was a fellow in hematology oncology at the UCLA Medical Center. And when I was a fellow, I was approached by uh, Denny Slayman uh, with the thought of building a sarcoma medical oncology program there. Uh, UCLA had a wonderful surgical sarcoma program, both uh, orthopedic oncology with Jeff Eckhart and Fred Eilber from a uh, surgical oncology standpoint. And, and then when I was a fellow, Fritz Eilber came and really started to explore, um, you know, the multidisciplinary aspects of what a sarcoma program should be. And so I was fortunate to think about programmatic development in sarcoma and what that would look like, uh, you know, in an early part of my career and, and really learning how to treat sarcoma patients from surgeons, right, which was an interesting approach. And then under you know, the mentorship of Denny Slayman and John Glasby, also thinking about the research aspects and the clinical trial aspects. I was there for about five years and I had the fortune to come to Memorial in 2011. Um, at the time, Gary Schwartz was here, who was chief of the Melanoma Sarcoma Service. And then when Gary left to um, uh, chair the division at Columbia, uh, we split the services to create a unique sarcoma service. So um, I've been chief of the sarcoma service at Memorial since 2014. And I mean, we have a, a really big program here. Right now we have 14 medical oncologists who see sarcoma patients. And we have a large multidisciplinary team with all of our colleagues from pediatrics to radiation oncology, orthopedists, and, and um, pathology and surgical oncologists. So you know, it's, it's a unique disease and that it's so many different subtypes. So it's wonderful to be, you know, at an institution that has a tremendous amount of expertise in, in understanding the disease and treating patients. Thank you, Bill. Brian, maybe you can describe your sarcoma journey as well. It's a little bit different than Dr. Tapps. And, and tell us a little bit about your sarcoma program at WashU in St. Louis. You know, it's always wonderful to follow Bill after hearing all that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the program at Memorial is an amazing, an amazing institution to strive to be, which is kind of the journey I got to be on, uh, which is when Bill moved to Memorial in 2011, I actually joined the faculty at Washington University in 2011 as the sole sarcoma provider at the time. And at the same time, I started a lab in tumor metabolism trying to really impact, you know, the sarcoma area, which, you know, 2011 doesn't feel like it's all that long ago, but in 2011, we had three drugs and, you know, we weren't doing that much. And I was supposed to be a rare tumor doctor with a lab. And 
you know, it was really interesting to kind of see a journey that evolved really quickly, thanks to the support of people like Bill and Gary and Bob Mackey and you, where, you know, this little program, uh, at what was actually a very big cancer center in the Midwest, didn't have a sarcoma service. We had a very, very good orthopedic surgeon named Doug McDonald at the time. And so what happened was actually because of the gifts of SARC, I'm actually becoming a SARC's career development awardee very early, was given kind of the window to develop a clinical program and a basic program at the same time. And over the last 11 years, we're now four medical oncologists, the very large surgical group with multiple pathologists and multiple radiation doctors that have really split into its own service. It's actually become, you know, a trials based service, which is really what I wanted to do, which was to not just treat sarcoma patients, but transform their treatment. And it's neat to have junior faculty that want to really follow a journey that I started once upon a time, which was to have a service in the middle of the country uh, where we really were giving access and new ideas. And out of this has launched so many things. And I couldn't be more humble or excited to really see the impact of like the journey when you dedicate yourself to sarcoma patients. Well, Brian, thank you for that as well. And, you know, hearing both of you, you did bring up a topic that I think is important as people that are listening to this uh, podcast realize that, yes, we are all medical oncologists. Yes, we do give therapeutic treatments, usually systemic therapies. But you both brought up the concept of a multidisciplinary group. And maybe you can both describe uh, how important it is to leverage the surgical input is uh, Dr. Tapp, you kind of said that's how you got your teeth cut in this world. And Brian, you've uh, started out with one surgeon and both of you have developed some programs. So maybe describe a little bit for us the, the role of multidisciplinary approach in sarcoma at both of your institutions. Yeah, I, I think, Scott, it's critical. And, you know, all of us in the field know the importance of having multidisciplinary experts uh, really involved in the care of patients, you know, not only up front and in the clinic, but also behind the scenes and in discussions. And I think, you know, the further we get along in this career, you realize that it's um, ever so critical, no matter how much we think we know, um, this is still a disease that can humble us at any time. So really working with experts to ensure that we're uh, providing comprehensive and holistic care for the patient is critical. Um, everybody brings a different understanding and approach to the disease, right? And that when you all bring it to the patient is critical. And I, I want to highlight that part of that multidisciplinary team is the patient themselves. It's, you know, our ability to not only understand the disease, uh, the biology, the clinical courses, the research that's going on, but ultimately how the disease is affecting the patient, what we hope to accomplish and what's important to them. So in, in my mind, um, really ensuring that you have that team surrounding the patient and supporting them, but inclusive of the patient is absolutely critical to make sure that we can, we can think about the right treatment paradigms for these tumors. No, I think I, I like the fact that what you actually brought up first and foremost is the center of the multidisciplinary tumor board is actually the patient. And I think, you know, patient autonomy is incredibly important. Patient support is important. Trying to mix, you know, their wishes with what's possible is, is really kind of the goal, right? You know, we're not here to uh, dictate anything. We're here to try power. And I, I think it's interesting that, you know, as we've expanded out, I've made friends with almost surgeons in almost every discipline uh, because, uh, you know, sarcoma goes everywhere. And so, you know, from neurosurgeons to podiatrists, I seem to know somebody now who's an expert. And, you know, I, one of the things that I very early on integrated was our interventional groups. And it's amazing what can be done by an interventionalist. Yeah, on top of just, you know, the standard radiation surgery and medical oncology, I think that, you know, these interventional radiologists and the physical therapists and the occupational therapists and everything from psychosocial support to dietary support is just key to making sure that you kind of have that true holistic approach that we're actually describing. And so I think, you know, there's model systems, there's model programs, and I think we all really, really strive to support that idea. You know, you bring up the point, both of you, that the patient is the center of any multidisciplinary group and the realization that we are humbled 
every single day because uh, there are a lot of smart people that we work with and they're not all medical oncologists, so that is correct. You know, one of the things that we try to do at SARC is to provide clinical trials. And Bill, you know, you were involved with uh, one of the largest sarcoma trials that we did, and that was SARC-21. And that was the international study of a randomized phase three study uh, comparing TH302 in combination with doxorubicin versus doxorubicin alone. Um, maybe you, you can describe how that concept was developed and uh, how you decided to collaborate and work with SARC on that trial. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great discussion, um, Scott, and it's something probably that we could devote a whole session to because I think even though it was a negative trial, what we learned uh, from that trial as a community was uh, just just amazing. You know, I think I think that trial was developed at a time where we as a sarcoma community had not yet forayed into large international, almost all comer trials. You know, it was right around the time that we were receiving data from some of our European colleagues that looked at adriamycin and ifosfamide versus adriamycin. It was right around the time the palifosfamide, which was another large study, was being run. So it was a time where our community was learning um, how to actually do large international studies. And so this was a study that uh, was proposed after some really encouraging phase one and phase two data, the combination of evophosphamide, TH302, and, and doxorubicin. But interestingly, you know, those were not randomized studies. So we were building a large uh, randomized study off of single arm data. And unfortunately, we still didn't have a good understanding of how single agent adriamycin did alone in an upfront population. Which, which is eventually how we designed the study. So there was a lot of guesswork going into the statistical design and outcomes of the study. I importantly though, um, you know, this was a study that ended up opening up in probably 99 sites worldwide. So it, it also was a study that tried to encompass the significant heterogeneity of the diseases we treat, as well as the practice patterns of sites across the world. And, and I think in conception, having an organization like SARC involved in this study was critical because it did a few things. One is it kind of galvanized the community around a large pivotal study. The, the other thing is it is it tried to best we could harmonize practice patterns and approaches to patients, right? So I think I think that's an important concept because when we think about from development to startup to execution, you know, this is years of involvement of, of clinical research and patient care. And having that central organization of SARC to help us do that was phenomenal. Um, unfortunately, you know, the study was negative, but we, we learned a lot through this approach of how we did things correctly and incorrectly. And, and I like to think that it not only set our understandings of how some of our conventional drugs do in the upfront setting, but it also gave us tremendous insight of how to potentially design clinical trials and sarcomas. And one of the things that it did is really helped us focus on some of the unique subsets that we've been focusing on and seeing some really impressive responses in, in outcomes. So it, it was a tremendous effort, a tremendous learning experience, but having the involvement of SARC was critical in the sense of unity of community and in patient care. No, thank you, Bill. And uh, it, first of all, we thank you for your leadership of running a large international study because all the queries, all the questions, and all the meetings that we had to oversee the conduct of that trial and your professionalism and leadership was greatly appreciated. And we do think that SARC did have a pivotal role in accomplishing that study. And, you know, at CTOS, we'll have a session that is specifically designed for lessons learned. And, will hopefully gain more lessons learned, not just from our SARC studies, but also the other studies that you did allude to as well. I, I know that we had a huge database of information and we've continued to try to leverage and help support individuals that are looking at different components because it was a very large study, because we had imaging, because we had pathology and correlatives. We've been able to do additional, what we would say, secondary studies. And uh, I think there's still opportunities. And I would just maybe like both your thoughts on the importance of the secondary correlative studies and anything that we do at SARC. You know, I want to compliment Bill and Sark on actually the design of Sark 21, because, 
you know, to this day, samples from Stark 21 are still being studied. The bank of, st of the material that was there, one of them was just published by, you know, Brian Crompton's group and CCR looking at, you know, circulating tumor DNA and outcomes. The control arm of that study is clean. The control arm of that study really allowed us to now do multiple studies to see if we can even go back and fundamentally begin to predict who's going to respond to doxorubicin. You know, the, the country can get access to these samples by writing into the bank. You know, Brian Crompton's group is looking at CT DNA. My group is looking at extracellular vesicles. And the, the information that you're getting out of that the impact of a study that was started a long time ago that was international and was a real community effort is coming back to benefit everybody because we're not done yet studying SARC-21. And because of that, I think the impact of this study is, becomes one of the most important studies we ever did because we have access as a community through the SARC bank to the samples. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. And I think to me, when I look back at the study, one of the important aspects of it was it was really our our strongest signal of how single agent doxorubicin works in various sarcoma subtypes in an upfront setting in the modern era. And, and when you think about SARC's involvement, not only did it allow for pristine data sets with the hope that it would be a pivotal study, but the fact that it was a negative study, you know, oftentimes what happens is we lose um, support of some of our pharmaceutical colleagues who are holding the data sets. In, in this particular study, I think we would have lost the data set had SARC not been involved, right? So having, having SARC curate that data set over time has really made it available uh, to, to all community members, as you said, right? So it's the radiomic studies that have come out of there. It's, it's the input about cardiotoxicity and long-term effects of treatment and outcomes. And, and it's a lot of the correlative experiments that are really yielding value to you know, what was done in SARC-21. Yeah, no, and the investment of a community in doing this, especially back then, I think it was unheard of. And I, I think this was well thought out and the impact, I think people probably weren't predicting because there are studies going on in 2022 and publications that are going through back from data that we did a long time ago from a study that I think is from that era, as you said, where we learned that we weren't going to be dealing with non-randomized single arm phase two data for the rest of our careers. That, you know, these trials in this era really showed we can do randomized trials at a rate that is the same as breast cancer, sometimes even faster than kidney cancer. We can do them randomized and we can actually get clear answers. Uh, you both bring up the, the important part of the foresight of any of us doing clinical trials to anticipate what we're going to need in the future. And I think we still have a gold mine that we still need to leverage in um, Bill's study on SARC-21. Brian, you did comment uh, that uh, you are a CDA award winner for SARC, and that was back in 2012. Do you believe that? And that's uh, you and both Adrian, Mariona, and Quez were both CDA uh, co-winners at that time. Uh, you had your award exploiting ASA1 deficiency in sarcoma. And maybe you can describe a little bit more of how that award helped you start your career and how that has continued to improve uh, your ability to do clinical trials and research. So, Brian? No, I, I think I'd like to first start off by saying the impact of the SARC CDA, especially if you go back and look who won it a decade ago. The people who were running it then had an unbelievable knack for picking out the future leaders of SARC, for whether it was, you know, Seth Pollack or Enrique or anybody back then. They're all people leading trials now. They're all people leading labs. And so this investment that was made by SARC into developing that next generation was just invaluable. And so, you know, as I joined the faculty uh, and applied to start looking in tumor metabolism, this allowed for a three-year window, because back then the SARC CDA was three years. And, you know, at $100,000 a year, you could run in 2012. You know, a small lab was well-funded because, you know, none of the money went to my salary. It went all straight to the people doing the research and the research itself. And so this actually led to, you know, the initial discoveries that we were doing at the time where we found a, a metabolic biomarker. That funding has gone through a series of papers to a phase two trial 
that is now going to a randomized phase three trial. And so whether you were looking at, you know, the NYUSA work that Seth was doing or my Arginine Diamonase work back then, you know, SARC has a way of paying it forward, just like SARC 21. We're still studying those samples. These investments in early research ideas are paying it forward. So I look forward to see where, where we are in 2032. Well, thank you for your work in this area. And how would you both encourage young investigators in their development and their willingness to apply for a SARC CDA? Scott, I, I think it's critical. And I think, you know, we speak uh, specifically about a career development award as opposed to a YIA. It's, it's really uh, providing a platform for researchers to develop independence and develop their career. And I think that's phenomenal. I think one of the added aspects of doing it through SARC is you're doing it in a like-minded community where you really hope that um, your work will have a deeper influence in, in the direction that the community is moving, but also to gain feedback and momentum, you know, maybe a little bit different as we go through some of the bigger um, award mechanisms or society where, you know, it's an admix of different tumors and research. You know, this is a like-minded community focused on sarcoma research. So, for example, with Brian's work, you know, it's been wonderful to see, you know, this just incredible work in metabolomics come out. Not only does that impact oncology, but the impact that it has in sarcoma is tremendous, but doing it within the community allows for an iterative process, the support of the work, the development of the clinical research, the correlatives, right? And I think that's one of the powers of applying specifically for a SARC CDA is, is you know, building that research and that platform within sarcoma and treating sarcoma patients. You know, single-handedly, the SARC CDA is probably the largest, less restricted amount of money you can get to launch your early career. And I, I think that investment is unparalleled, you know, for a rare disease with a good idea, you know, uh, based on, you know, the fact our community is small, turns out the pay line or the number of people that are actually funded compared to the number of applicants is quite high. And I, I think that this is a, a tool is really just probably the most impactful thing that the field does. And what I like is that it's registered within SARC and that the people that were really supporting me early on, you know, Bob Mackey, Gary Schwartz, even Bill, you know, it, it's a, everybody knew what I was doing. Cause you know, I don't keep very many secrets cause the, I, there's no reason to keep secrets. But they really then pushed me to keep going because, you know, research is a, not necessarily a linear thing to do. And they really it creates a window where there's now a program in St. Louis that may not have been here if I had to go to a larger institution or so not a larger institution, but a larger sarcoma program so that I, I could hide off in a lab and then really develop independently. It really allowed for access to patients and patient samples. And then you study these things and you go, Eureka, maybe we should try this. And this is a story that's being repeated over and over and over again amongst the generations now. And this is now generations of SARC CDA winners, which is really exciting. When I was looking at all the award winners, I'm thinking like, wow, SARC really did invest in some uh, high quality individuals and labs. And as you said, Brian, we're starting to see some a continued return on the investment your career in sarcoma is a small community, and then the phase two, and now the phase three, and maybe SARC will be able to participate and help support that study as well. And that goes along, Bill. I was just, we were just thinking about it, and I, I was talking to other individuals. You know, you were involved with ASCO in developing a career development award type of philosophy within ASCO. Maybe you can share lessons learned at your time with your leadership part in ASCO and how we can use that to leverage our community in sarcoma and SARC. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, when I think about my involvement in ASCO, um, I, I was fortunate uh, for the majority of my time to serve on what was originally the Health Disparities Committee and eventually became the Health Equity Committee. And it was, it was really the component within ASCO thinking about ways to allow for equity in healthcare, right, in cancer care, which is a really difficult thing in the, in the United States. And, and the committee was just phenomenal in um, some of the projects 
that were tackled. And this ranged from diversity in the workforce to gaps in insurance. Some of the areas that I've been more recently involved in, I think is very applicable to SARC and what we do, especially with rare cancers. And, and one is it's access to medical care. It's access to appropriate care. And importantly, it's, it's access to clinical trials. And it's breaking down not only the barriers of clinical trial enrollment, but often you know, some of the uh, eligibility criteria that are brought into clinical trials, right? And I think this has been one of ASCO's greatest initiative of late. Um, for example, I'm on a task force that is uh, finding out um, more information of how to support clinicians and providers that are serving the underserved, is how to create a presence within their communities, and actually how to create a value proposition for them in ASCO, right? So we can understand their best practices, their needs, their challenges, and then provide support for them. Now, one of the things that I would love SARC to do is to think about some ways to improve access not only of clinical trials, which I think would be wonderful, but also healthcare in the sense of um, sarcoma providers for sarcoma patients, because not only is it a rare disease, which creates significant amounts of challenge in diagnosis and finding the right care, but then when we think of the challenges of access to appropriate healthcare in the United States alone, I think it, it can add an extra burden on a lot of patients with sarcoma. And I think these could be some really wonderful initiatives that SARC thinks about in the future. And I, I'd love to work with you in some of those regards because patients with sarcoma also come to SARC to understand not only how to receive care, the appropriate care, but again, it's this comprehensive and holistic nature of care that we need to provide sarcoma patients. And, and I think an organization like SARC would be wonderful to think about how, how we can do that better within the United States. Excellent point, uh, Bill, and we'll definitely follow up on that. And it, it highlights a, a component that we sometimes at major institutions start to forget that getting access to patients to sarcoma centers, we take it for granted they can get here. But there is a disparity of getting not expert sarcoma opinion locally when they don't have the resources to um, get to centers that uh, have huge multidisciplinary groups, clinical trials, et cetera. So I think that will be a great opportunity and challenge uh, for us at SARC and the sarcoma community. So thank you, Bill. Yeah, I'd actually love to hear Brian's thoughts because one of the things I'm you know, most proud of what Brian did is is to really build a huge sarcoma network and provide access to people within the Midwest where there weren't always care options, right? And Brian, it's just been remarkable what you've accomplished. And, and in a sense, you've decentralized the clinical trial machinery a little bit to help with that access. But I'd love to hear a little bit more because it should serve as an example of what we can do. You know, I've always had that kind of field of dreams vision, which is if you build it, they will come. And I, I think that is the first barrier that people building a sarcoma program need to get over, which is I'm not seeing that many patients. But then you open up a program and all of a sudden, you know, one of the benefits of living in St. Louis is most of the freeways in the U.S. that go east-west converge here. And where, you know, ultra wealthy patients fly to a coast because, you know, they can. My major patient population is actually that that drives and it drives within an eight hour radius. And so it's interesting to see how far away people will come for access to novel agents. You know, it, I always kind of thought it was silly to have somebody come here so that I could give doxyrubicin better than somebody else. You know, that was never what I envisioned my role as. But doxyrubicin, given with something like alertumab in 2011, was novel. And it was worth traveling for. You know, doxyrubicin, given with, you know, on SARC-21 at the time, was novel. You should try it. Because we all knew what doxorubicin would do by itself. So it needs a new friend. And I think we're still in search of that new friend for doxorubicin, or just to replace doxorubicin, which would be even better, right? But if you really say, I'm going to provide access and then allow that, but make sure that if you're building a program, you're actually providing something novel. And, you know, I think the greatest rewards are when you're treating a patient and you see something work and you see something that's new and novel and it's working for the first time. And I wish I could tell you what all these agents are, but we're being recorded. There are so many neat and new things coming, right? 
and um, you know these new oral medications, these new oral medications that are often new thoughts. You know, the basic science that's been going on since 1960 is now in clinic. And we're living in that generation where what we were taught, or at least what I was taught for 2011, no longer applies. You know, sarcoma is no longer a three lines of therapy, one size fits all world. I'm kind of glad I started in 2011. This has become so nuanced and so complex that we need more CDA winners focusing on more rare subsets of more rare diseases because this is where that biology is and we have the ability to exploit it. And so while there's a role for the people that are going to be running the programs and running the trials, you know, one of the neatest things I think I did here was there are two basic science labs next to each other in sarcoma at WashU. And we don't work on the same thing. You know, the other labs run by Angie Herbie. She only studies and sees plexiform neurofibromas and malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And, you know, we can support a full-time faculty member that only sees malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors because they will come. So, you know, I think that we provide an unbelievable service and we need to believe in ourselves because if you have that field of dream view that, you know, if you build it, they will come. They come because, you know, in this patient-centric model, people want to see somebody where their disease is not rare. You bring up a, both of you brought up a distinction that kind of just eluded me, and I think it's important. And one is to get expert opinion of what to do, and that might be multidisciplinary sarcoma care and how to reach out to patients that can't get there. The second one is to enroll in clinical trials. And sometimes they are aligned and sometimes they're not. But I think as SARC proceeds moving forward, we, we got to accomplish both. Reach patients where they are if they can't get AOR drive and get multidisciplinary input. And then secondly, is to provide clinical trial opportunities, not only at major centers, but elsewhere. And both you, uh, Brian and Bill, have a great clinical trials program. And for those that are out there, they might start to wonder, how do you start to think about clinical trials at your institution, whether you come to SARC to run a clinical trial to get input, whether you do a CTEP trial, industry trial, or Brian, you lead now the Midwest Sarcoma Trials Partnership, which is a collaborative group in the Midwest. So maybe to share with other groups that don't have access to major groups like you both have, how do you start to develop a clinical trials portfolio and how do you decide on the different uh, funding mechanism? Maybe Bill, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging question, Scott, because, I mean, when we think about sarcoma, we're really thinking about 100 different disease entities, right? And, and patients come to most of our centers, not just to say we have heard of a disease or recognize the disease, but like Brian said, that we've developed, you know, really detailed research programs in this disease so we can think about the biology, think about what may be the best treatments for patients, and, and also what's important to the patients in considering that treatment. The, the problem is all of our sites, no matter how big or small, we can't be comprehensive across the board. So we have to work in a collaborative fashion. And I think that's one of the uh, beautiful aspects of SARC is, is it's a, a network. It's a lattice that actually brings together all of the institutions so that we can work off of each other and within our strengths, right? And I think when we think about building programs, we want to begin to think internally of what are the strengths, what are the interests, um, what are the diseases that we see within our patient populations, and then begin to think of uh, more research programs that we can develop. And as you do that, that can begin to feed the biology and ideas about the clinical trials and help you identify the different mechanisms to run a clinical trial. And again, it may be very variable based on the disease or the drug that you're, you're looking to treat. Along those lines, though, I do think it's really important to align with organizations like SAR to be members of, of some of the NCI um, cooperative groups, because it also provides opportunities to get involved in clinical trials that you may not otherwise have. And again, that allows for um, treatments for patients that 
that often don't have a lot of conventional treatments for their disease. Um, again, some of these diseases we treat are fairly new entities where even us in the sarcoma community are figuring out how to treat them, right? So that's why clinical trials are so important because it not only allows us to improve outcomes, but it allows us to understand biology and think about better ways to treat our patients. And I think where we are in clinical trial and drug development in sarcoma is very unique in that we are seeing a lot of new drugs come out onto the market, NCCN compendium listed or FDA approved. But the impetus for many of those now rests within the sarcoma community to understand how to appropriately apply them, right? So gathering this knowledge in clinical practice and on clinical trials is a huge aspect of, of what we're doing. You know, I'm happy to add to that. I, th I think that, you know, you had a, a really good list of, you know, the types of trials. You did leave off one, which was the investigator-initiated clinical trial that can also be industry-funded. And, you know, if you're from the eyes of a junior investigator that wants to get a program off the ground, I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm helping mentor Vanessa Yulo, who was a fellow of mine who's now at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I think there's a path to build your program. I think the first thing you do is you use a cooperative group trial and open it. But not only just open it, you have to be a strong participant, right? The community, if you have limited resources, is going to go and open it by the place that knows they're going to get an accrual from. And so you need to show that you're going to be a good citizen and that you're going to put people on trial. You'll get noticed very quickly. You know, we're a small community. We choose the sites. And so if you're going to open up a trial through the SARTNEC where everybody wants to be involved, we all want to be involved. It's exciting to be involved. But you also have to then follow through and be an active participant in the trials. You just can't have an entire group of things that are open that you don't accrue to because no one can financially afford to do that. And so, you know, as you open your cooperative group trials, you'll then be noticed by the people that are in the room, some of which is industry, which will give you the opportunity to begin writing your first investigator initiated trials. You know, you'll then be to participate in our larger phase three trials. And so this is kind of a journey where, you know, you have to actively participate and learn how to work with your patients to get them access to the new things. And I think the hardest thing to do as a junior participant is learn how to effectively talk about a placebo-controlled trial. Because I think this is a challenge, right? But then I think that the most interesting thing that I would ask both Scott and Bill if you look at all the phase three trials we've done in the last decade, do you know what the most active agent has been? It's been placebo. And in fact, placebo has outperformed a number of agents that we've looked at. And so placebo comes with less toxicity and placebo comes with an answer. And sometimes, at least in the last decade, the answer for the drug you've wanted, which I'd like to package, is you wanted to be on the placebo arm of our trials. It came with less toxicity and the same outcomes, right? So I think we as you know, investigators need to support people in understanding that the reason we do placebo-controlled trials is because by the time you get to the end, a lot of times, placebo is the winner. And so you can't be afraid of talking about placebo. Yeah, I think, you know, it's the understanding of what are the trials that are going to be important, as you said, investigator initiated trials. And, you know, both of you are, are mentors to your teams at your local site. Bill, you said that you have 14 medical oncologists. Brian, you have four oncologists that you are mentoring. And, you know, part of what your experiences that you have in leadership at your institutions are is that we at SARC need to help mentor and have those discussions, Brian, as you said, of young investigators that might start out at uh, N of one or two. Both of you started when your programs are a lot smaller and both of you have built out your programs. So where do you see us at SARC trying to mentor young investigators that might be at single sites with one or two that are trying to get into the clinical trial space and, uh, uh, more importantly is not only helping yourself out at your local institution, but have the common good of the sarcoma community. Yeah, Scott, I mean, I think 
I think Sark is in a really unique position to do this, right? I think it's in a unique position to build our community in this regard. And there's different ways to do it. You know, when we think about some of our fellows who are interested in drug development, right? There's a whole um, curriculum that we put them through so they can understand the different facets of what needs to be done to be able to bring new treatments to patients, right? And it ranges from understanding science and being in the lab or having footprints in the lab, how to read science and think about um, discoveries that are practical and be taken into the clinic. It's who to partner with to do that. It's understanding all of the different phases of drug development from concept development to LOI submission to banging down the door a million times until you can get a trial to writing the protocol to going through the regulatory processes internally to working with cooperative group networks and governmental agencies to performing the trials, you know, all the things that can go from startup and, and issues that can develop in a trial. And then it's even to the regulatory processes and how to get drugs you know, across a regulatory line and out there for patients, right? And that doesn't even come and call into the question the proper usage of the drug or even the appropriate trial design for that disease or drug. And what's nice about SARC is you have some of the world's leading investigators within your organization, and you run all facets of clinical trials from investigator initiative to, you know, the, the pivotal randomized placebo-controlled bemaciclib study right now in liposarcoma. So I think it's how you can give access to all, all aspects of those processes to young investigators and allow them to be involved, right? Even if it's just learning passively um, by being a part of the process to giving them ownership of some of the processes and tapping them into the mentors who are doing it so that they can even be sitting on the phone calls um, when problems arise or issues arise or success happens. And, and I think that's the wonderful thing about SARC and the sarcoma community is that it's very collaborative, it's very giving, and we all understand that we succeed by building up everyone else, right? So I, I think that's why SARC is in a unique position um, because you have that curriculum, you have that uh, cadre of clinical trials where people can, can learn from. You know, one of the greatest things about SARC is SARC is us. And one of the greatest things about us as a field is that there has never been anyone in our field that I don't think was not supportive of me coming up. I mean, if you think of, you know, a field that was brought to you by Gary Schwartz and Bob Mackey and Larry Baker and uh, Bob Benjamin and Treas Patel, they've never been anything but more humble and supportive of everybody that's come before them. I'm sorry, after them. And I think, you know, as you get to the next set of leaders under you know, Bill Tapp and Andy Wagner and that generation with Rashmi Chung, it's the same. And as we move forward in time now with, you know, Scott, you as the medical director, et cetera, Sark is going to continue to be an open group of physicians that will only support our field. And I think there's not a junior investigator at any institution that wouldn't be supported if they just ask. And that's what I like about this field. We are here for ourselves to build this field because we're really not here for ourselves. That was a mis- I shouldn't have said that. We're actually here for the patients. And because we're all very patient-centric, we're not really that worried about our own careers. And this is how we actually build the field and move it forward. And we have. And I think as a field, we need to be proud of ourselves that we have drugs for things like epithelioid sarcoma. We have drugs for, you know, pigmented villanodular synovitis to the point where we renamed the disease tenosynovial giant cell tumor. We have, as a field, made an impact because we've really supported each other and not gone to war like other fields. And I think this is something that, as a field, we should really be proud of. And this really comes as the flagship you know, thing that really joins all these things together is membership in SARC. And that SARC network allows us just to call everybody up. That was wonderful, Brian. I just want to add to that. I mean, the other thing that I want to highlight that Sark's done exceedingly well is create a voice and a conduit for patient advocacy and patient advocate groups. And, you know, Denise Ranke was huge in that regard. But what that does is it really brings in the most important component of what we do. And that's how to think about 
drug development and discovery, not only in the context of the disease and what's right for the patient and how to include the patient's voice in the clinical trial and in uh, clinical development strategies. And I think when we think about diseases like tenosynovial giant cell tumor, it was the patients who really helped directed you know, what were the important outcomes that we needed to achieve for them and, and how to actually build trials around that. And I think that's uh, another unique aspect of SARC that you can offer to young investigators, and that's access to open and honest discussions with patients and patient advocacy groups, because that really should inform, you know, how they build their programs and, and what trials they're involved in and how to design the trials correctly. You both of you brought up that excellent point. You know, SARC does have the Research Advocacy Council, and this was set up as Denise, as you said, Bill, and we need to continue to leverage that because that is a great source of knowledge and it impacts how we deliver care and what's important for our patients and their families. So that's an excellent point. We did get one question sent to us and we'll reserve it for the next podcast. And that is really uh, as a teaser, what is the biggest translational basic science research need for sarcoma? And that will highlight what we're going to have at our next uh, meeting for SARC Talk. Episode number two will be an uh, interview with uh, Dr. Inga Schaefer from the Harvard University and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And she will be talking about research aspects. So maybe we'll even bring in uh, Jonathan Fletcher, our chief scientific officer, for that meeting as well. Dr. Tapp, Dr. Van Tine, any final thoughts? Well, I'd like to conclude by thanking SARC for actually going public like this. I think this is exciting that we can just put the message out that our unifying overall collaborative group that was built by us, for us, for our patients is now really still now in its second decade making huge impacts. So thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, Scott, and I'll just echo that. I mean, I think a wonderful organization that does a tremendous amount of good. I think it highlights the collaborative nature of the, the community, you know, patients in, included. And um, I just appreciate all you're doing and, and having us here to talk about it today. Thank you, Dr. Tapp, Dr. Van Tine, for being our first guest on SARC Talk, episode number one. And we look forward to many more engagements as we move forward in SARC and continue to build, as Brian said, this is us. We're all a part of SARC. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you all in uh, Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a SARC talk. To find out more about SARC, please visit our website at sarctrials.org. To suggest a topic or ask questions, please email us at sarctalk at sarctrials.org. And remember, together we can find a cure for all forms of sarcoma.